gods of the theater smile on us you who sit up there stern in judgment smile on us you who look down on actors and who doesn't bless this yearly festival and smile on us we offer you some hello there theater people and welcome to episode 40 of festus in the green room it's bruce and melanie here hi bruce hey melanie how are we doing today i'm good how are you I'm doing all right. I think you're lying to me, but okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> you said I'm doing good. I know you've had a heck of a day. Come on now. <laughs> it's, just, it's just been a busy, yeah. crazy, it's been a busy, crazy week. And, yeah. a, and today was just completely insane. Yeah, I get it. No problem. Uh, it was just a lot of emails, a lot of communication, a lot of craziness, you know. That's just good. one of those days. Keeps life moving. Oh my goodness. You aren't kidding. <laughs> So before today, you know, what have you been up to? Well, we both saw Dear Evan Hansen at the Peace Center. That's right. We did. And it was lovely. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was. I mean, I have a few quibbles, of course, you know, because okay. but it's really more of a production thing, not a, not a um, story or, or actually, per, well, I guess it is a little bit performance based, but it's because it's these actors, you know, these young actors drive me crazy when they don't. <laughs> when they don't, you know, project. It's amazing to me. They all rely on their microphones. Not all of mm. them. Some of them, you know, are, are there in the moment and really, you know, working and doing their job. But then some of them just, it just, it's like, I, I guess there was one director who used to say, they're like talking into their belly button. You know, it's like, they, it's like, you know, they're just not, mm. uh, you know, they're not uh, p presenting out to the house. I mean, th this is a huge house they have to perform in. And yes, you're mic'd, but you know what? You still have to do your job and project. And so I get a little frustrated when that happens because I miss words. And I know if I'm missing words and I'm not hard of hearing, I'm not 20 anymore, but I'm still not hard of hearing, you know, and then I know that other audience members right. are. And we do have a great system at the Peace Center with, you know, a hearing loop and, you know, and, and then um, headphone availability and all that kind of thing, which is great. But, you know, you can only do so much of that. And you know, you shouldn't have to for people that are able-bodied and can hear well. You just need to do your job, Pete said. <laughs> so anyway. but I, <laughs> So, I've, you know, yeah, there you go. I've gone off a little bit. But it was a great – but it was but it was really a nice show. I loved the story. Um, you know, I was really engaged, of course. The music was beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was presented really well. It was, yeah, it was everything that I kind of expected and hoped that it would be, you know. So, uh, so that was good. You know, you know, you know, it's a great show. You come home and put on the soundtrack. And I was listening to the soundtrack last night. I was doing some things around the house and just had the soundtrack on, and it was, you know, it's just great. So, there you go. That's my take. How about you? All right, fair enough. So I think I had a slightly different experience than you did, maybe because I saw the understudy. And this, this is nothing against anybody who's in a lead role or, you know, there's nothing. Of course they do their job. Of course they do. And they do it very well, extremely well. Everybody does in these productions. I mean, they're professionals for a reason, you know, but we all do this, all professionals in their job. Sometimes you get, it gets a little monotonous. It gets a little, mm -hmm. you know, you've just done it every day. So, and you might be tired and maybe it's time for a break or, there's various things that play into it. So sometimes it happens. I think it's happened to all of us in a run. Yeah, could be. Could some be. Some days at certain points, you just maybe you you get a little you get a little used to it. You're used to it, and right, it's easy. Sure, it's easy to forget that the maybe the audience hasn't ever heard the these words or heard these songs. No, that's true. So or or they don't know the story. So you got to kind of it's it sometimes it's you know some days are better than others so but with understudies right understudies very often are very fresh when they come to the role because they haven't been doing it every single day <laughs> yeah. and they're they're often very much on their toes because especially if it's an understudy or a swing who's covering several tracks they may and they don't get to do it every day they're gonna they're gonna have to really focus okay who am i playing what am i saying what am, where am i where am i going you know so, so there's a, a certain heightened focus i think when understudies go on so sometimes that actually results in a really on point performance so you get you get a freshness you get an alertness to it that, you know, and I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that the leads don't do this, but, you know, we all have our days. Sure. 
I said, yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree with what you're having to say. I've, I've seen multiple production, multiple performances of a tour of a of one particular tour, and I've gotten a chance to see understudies then perform, and I've been pleasantly surprised because, uh, you know, they come in and they're just they're just great. And I think I think you're absolutely right. I think it's because they're coming in with that freshness that because they don't get to do it every every day, you know, and they're and they're eager. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. Right. Exactly. So I was quite pleased with the performance. I had no quibbles about it whatsoever. And I too went home after the show and put on the cast recording. Cause the music, the music to me was, was the star of the show. I think the music, the score, Oh my goodness. I love it. Yeah. It's really good storytelling mm. and it's moving musically. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, not only are the lyrics, you know, you know, telling you the story very well. The, the the melodies and the tune is are engaging, right? You know, and that's important, yeah. right? And it's not a big old dance musical, you know. It's, no, it's got a they they threw it a little choreography here and there where they could, but it's you know it's not about that at, at any at any stretch, mm -mm. you know, in any stretch. It's it's really about the music and the lyrics. Yeah, it is. It is indeed good stuff. Yes, I liked it. And that was the end of the season for the Peace Center's Broadway series. Yeah, and the next one's starting up right away with the band's visit. I, I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. There's hardly a gap. So. Yeah. <laughs> right on to the next one. Usually there is, but not, on, not yeah. this year. So August, we will see the band's visit. Excellent. Well, before we get to August, there's a million other things happening there around the are. state. And we're going to talk about one of those productions yes, today. Yes, we're going to talk to Christopher Rose, who is directing Heather's out of the Market Theater there in Anderson. Yay, Heather's. Yeah, <laughs> no, your favorite show. You're so well, excited. Well, I don't know that I call oh, it my favorite point. show. I just... No, but just a show that you're really looking forward yeah, to. Because yeah, because for me, Heather's is nostalgia. You know, we've talked about the jukebox yeah. musicals and some of the other things that are nostalgia maybe for older generations. For me, a child who grew up in the 80s, there you go. It, that that film. I, re, I just remember it so well. So Yeah. It was a big deal when it came out for, for people yep, like me, people true, my that's age. That's right. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about Christopher Rose. I shall. Christopher Rose is an upstate director and performer. He earned his BA in communications from Pensacola Christian College. And for over a decade, he served as the Minister of Music and Worship at North Point Church in Greenville, South Carolina. Most recently, Christopher had the privilege of directing First Baptist of Ivy Gap at Milltown Players and Center Stage South Carolina's production of Into the Woods. Christopher also directed Milltown Players' Romeo and Juliet, winner of SCTA's and SCTC's 2018-2019 Community Theater Festival's Best Play. He was also awarded Best Director at SCTA for his work on Romeo and Juliet. The production recently returned from the AACT Festival, where it represented the Southeastern United States and received several national awards. In addition, Christopher directed Milltown Players' award-winning production of A Mice and Men and their staging of To Kill a Mockingbird, which earned him Best Director of a Play by Carolina Curtain Call's 2018 Reader's Choice Awards. At the Market Theatre Company in Anderson, South Carolina, he has directed Cabaret, earning him another CCC Award for Best Director of a Musical 2018 and Musical of the Year 2018 for Medium Small Community Theatres. Also for the Market Theatre Company, Christopher directed Julius Caesar and Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, which was the winner of Carolina Curtain Call's Reader's Choice for Best Play in 2017. On stage, Christopher has been seen in numerous shows across the upstate, a few of his recent roles include Dan in Next to Normal at the Market, Sweeney and Sweeney Todd at CTA, Judas and Jesus Christ Superstar at GLT, now GT, Callahan and Legally Blonde at GT, and Henrik in A Little Night Music at the Warehouse Theater, among many others. Christopher is currently directing Heather's The Musical at the Market Theater Company, which is what we're going to talk about today. Woohoo, Heather's! Hey, yeah! <laughs> I'm excited. So why don't we just get right into it? Yeah, we should. It's always nice to catch up with someone we both know. So this will be fun. Yeah. Let's Alrighty. have a listen. Okay. Whoa. Heather, Heather, Heather. And someone. Heather, Heather, Heather. And a big Heather, Heather, Heather. Veronica? Veronica, Veronica, Veronica. And you know, you know, you know, life can be beautiful. You hope you dream. 
Dennis, welcome to the green room. Glad to be here. Yeah, so nice. And it's always nice when Melanie and I can get together with somebody we know and right. we've worked with and yes. we're, you know, friends with really acquaintance friends, you know, all that kind of thing. Sure. And it's always great to talk history and catch up. We, we sometimes get really way off on tangents because <laughs> we just want to catch up. And we have the yeah, gift yeah. of gab. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And this is, this is super exciting because we're all three of us in the same room. It's in been person. a while since Melanie and I have done this. Yes. Yeah. We've been doing this online format, which yes. has been cool, you know, remotely, and it's been kind of convenient, but this is always nice when we can see each other's lovely faces. Yes, you know. and, and, and our have guests. our guest right, right, right here as well. <laughs> and actually, we're, we're recording from, Chris, tell us where we're recording uh, This is CU exactly. ICAR. Uh-huh. Um, so it's the Clemson University uh, ICAR Center off of Lawrence Road. Uh-huh. Um, so we are here in the Tech Cafe in the shared conference room. Very and nice. uh, taking advantage of this great modern facility here. It's really beautiful. It's gorgeous. Yeah. It's quite incredible. Super comfortable. Yeah. We'd like this wherever we go. Wouldn't we like this? I would love this. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know. Maybe we'll get to the point where we can uh, rent some office space here. Yeah. And <laughs> use this as a the time. Yeah, That's right. <laughs> oh, well, cool. Well, we're here to talk with Chris and, and his endeavors in theater. And so tell us, Chris, just a little bit about how you got started in theater. My first show was at five years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was a, a K-5 uh, tell me, wait, 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 Don't tell me. You were a munchkin in Wizard of Oz. I was not. No. <laughs> I was not. Um, it was the K-5 graduation play at my little private Christian school in uh-huh. Easley, and it was the gingerbread man. Okay. Oh, very I played good. the gingerbread man. <laughs> um, so you were, so the, you were the star. I yeah. was. Oh, wow. A very precocious little lead in a velvet brown <laughs> gingerbread suit. Is there a picture of this? Probably. Yeah, okay. My mom still has the costume in a closet in her much. house. It has pink rickrack for the icing. <laughs> It was glorious. And I was that kid who memorized everyone's lines. Yeah, yes. of course. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and felt the need, if they didn't say them fast enough, to give them to them. When or they if they missed a word, probably. Exactly. You One word, I would in. have to yeah. whisper it to yeah. them. So, yeah, very precocious. Yeah, that was my son, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that's kind of where it all began, um, the, really. I didn't do theater a lot through school until my 10th grade year, I mm-hmm. guess it was. My mom had me sing a lot in church growing up, things mm-hmm. like that. Um, but my 10th grade year, the drama teacher came to me because I was more of a choir kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and she said, hey, we're doing your good men, Charlie they Brown. They needed a guy. Can you yeah. come be Charlie Brown? <laughs> oh, nice. So I had a good Always record nice of giving be, those. Yeah, nice to be asked. You <laughs> know, the, to, you're a guy. You're in theater. Yeah, yeah. You get roles. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's a lot easier. Yeah. Um, but so I did that. But I guess, like, for me, the bug really bit um, – Back in 95, I had some friends who were doing shows at SCCT. Okay. And uh, this is back when Rick Standridge was the director there. Yeah. And um, I was like, hey, maybe, I, maybe I'll try that out. And so I auditioned for uh, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor mm-hmm. Dreamcoat. Sure. And I got into the ensemble, and I was super excited about was that. Was that when John Brigham, did he play it Joseph? It was. No it was his way. first. His first. John Brigham and... Uh, uh, Ryan Bradburn and I mean everybody who you still get to kind of work right, with uh, sure. around town was in that show and we were all kids That's uh, we were all kids I was uh, 16 um, I yeah. think in the show and uh, someone got one of the brothers got ousted from the cast for some reason I don't know if he quit <laughs> or he got fired or what um, but I got moved up to Ooh. a brother role, and I think uh, the sheer egoism of it is what like got me really interested because <laughs> we were backstage at the Peace Center because that's back yeah, when you they know, did all a, of their the shows were on the main too. hall. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and we were sitting in the hallway, and Rick was giving notes, and he said something about uh, the part of Nathalie, and that he had had to recast, and he said it was the best mistake he had ever made in his life. Oh, oh. I was sold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was sold. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where it started, and that's then I cool. did. I was going to do theater ed. Um, um, in in school, but I ended up not wanting to do that because there were more classes that I wanted to take just doing a straight major. Mm-hmm. And so I did that and just found out that I loved communicating with people and pulling stuff out of them. So I, uh, I graduated, came back to town, I directed a few shows, mm-hmm. and then life got busy and I didn't sure. do theater for 10 years. Wow. wow. Um, I worked <laughs> for yeah. 10 years, right? Well, um, and, did you and, know that you missed it? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Huge hole. Yeah. Okay. Huge hole. Um, but you know, you have bills to pay yeah. And, yeah. and you've got to do that. So my first, my first foray back into theater after 10 years was with both of you yeah, guys. Yeah. And Sweeney Todd. And Sweeney Todd. Right. And was I remember that. That was yeah. my first show I do back. remember yeah. you saying that. Yeah. And so it was just getting back into it. And you know, you're not going to walk back into the theater community and direct. Right, no, no, no. So it was okay. Yourself. Let's let's establish this yeah. through the acting chops, and then yeah. about half halfway through 
between then and now, uh -huh. um, I was like, okay, let's start working on that tech side of the resume to get yeah, that yeah. fleshed right. out. So you just kind of step in, and but the goal was to to direct because that's what I love to do. And so, uh -huh. so even good. more than being on stage, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. You know, I find definitely. I hear that for people that are you know that are really direction minded, but that have you know spend a lot of time on the stage. They somehow that really meets all the it pushes all the buttons for well, them. You, I guess yeah. you get a finger in every pie. Yeah, which is which is fun because it allows you a lot of creativity that yeah. you know one position doesn't allow mm -hmm. you. Yeah. But then it's just you get to make other people shine mm -hmm. you know yeah. you get to help them have a space to to grow and to build and to trust each other and to help each other and it's yeah it's you know it's a heart thing yeah you know you, sure. you can get in there there's and an incredible in sense of pride when when you can help some a, a cast grow and a show grow and, yeah mm -hmm. you know yeah. you can see it all up there and you can say look at you look at my baby <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah well that's excellent that's excellent I, I I'm always kind of amazed how the transition uh, that people take and the the, the the different things that they do that bring them finally to to what they're doing currently and and the joy that it brings them uh, because I'm I don't know I, I've been in theater in a while and I just love the, the performance aspect you know and that's where I guess I feel most comfortable maybe I yep. don't know so I love it when somebody has another you know part of it that they love and you know, yeah, it's seeing the passion of people, whether it's in a, a design position, mm -hmm. costumes, lights, whatever it is, you know, sets or or just back behind these things. I love to watch someone who's running crew who just is living their best life running yeah, crew. Yeah. Right. It's fantastic. Yeah. But it's it, it's everyone has a different passion. And, you know, yeah. for me, it's that communication process and that uh, analyzing and, and projecting ideas to people. And, you know, mm -hmm. I love that. Very good. Excellent. So well, well, that's a lot. You 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 gave us a lot in just a nutshell of everything that you you know. <laughs> man, it yeah. took us your journey. What what are some of your inspirations? Um, My casts, okay, are Aww. huge. They're yeah. huge. I, like I said, like people have so many stories to tell. Yeah. Right. And if you if you create that communication process with your cast and you listen to them and you find out what's important to them and why they're doing the show. What, for some mm -hmm. people, it's just, I wanted to do a show. But yeah. for most people, there's something that draws them to a particular audition. And if you can tap into that and you can tap into their story, your process is easy as a director because mm -hmm. you just get them to tell the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I tell my cast over and over and over again that the chief responsibility of us as theater artists is to tell the truth in a way that our audiences can hear it. Mm -hmm. mm. Right. Sure. And so that that's that really inspires me. And of course, a great text. Yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah. A great text, a great score. You mm -hmm. know, I've I've had the ability to and the opportunities to direct Sophocles and Shakespeare mm -hmm. and Andrew Bovell, who is huge to me i love mm -hmm. andrew bowl and you know candor and ebb and sondheim you know it's just yeah. these these brilliant people these brilliant people and you just read what they put on the paper mm -hmm. and let it do something for you so mm -hmm. that really inspires me that's cool very good so you've acted a lot and directed all over the upstate and audience will see your work at um greenville theater which used to be greenville little theater uh, yes. Center State, it's where so hard to see. make that I change know, should, so we always kind of preempt <laughs> yeah it, i have a cup on my desk right now that's greenville little theater and i right. feel like i'm betraying their their rebranding by drinking my coffee out of it just, just i need get a little piece of tape and put it over the yeah. there you yeah. go <laughs> milltown players also and market theater tell us what's what are some of your career highlights because i'm I'm sure there's a highlight at each one of those venues. Oh, yeah. I mean, multiple highlights uh, in acting. Uh, actually, one of my highlights in acting was with you, Melanie, uh, Arena's Val. Mm. Oh, okay. okay. Lazar. <laughs> that character was just so good to sink your teeth into, yeah. right? Like, it's just... Yeah. I, I called them my Jew crew <laughs> at the time. <laughs> Hannah Morton and um, Libby Ricardo, yes, right? Yeah. Um, they were now. fantastic. Yeah. They were fantastic. First time I ever got to act out being in the room with someone giving birth on a stage yeah. that was, and with no bed right. <laughs> and no baby right and, and no, no baby, no baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so that was great um well, I, you guys are amazing uh, uh, what a great and the show. chemistry between the ensemble well, and having miss cast. miss heller there the opening yes. night yes. Yeah, Trudy Heller's, yeah. Just, yeah 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 fantastic i know that that was the beginning of the the fringe series at center stage was that really the first one no it wasn't the first one first season it was the first season wasn't it the first season yeah and i think it was maybe the second one yeah i think it was the second one Real close yeah. to the beginning there. Yeah. What and a it was, great show. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Um, I 
also Les Mis, of course. Mm -hmm. That was at Greenville Theater, and mm -hmm. Les Mis because it's Les Mis. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's right. Yeah. It is, um, to sing that score is such a great experience. And Jesus Christ Superstar, doing Judas in Jesus Christ Superstar, that was a kind of a bucket list role. Mm. It really was. Um, directing wise, when the rain stops falling, that's an Andrew. Which Bogle. was a wonderful, I have to say, which is a wonderful production. I mean, I wasn't sure about it when I first read it. You know, like mm, this is a little odd. This one, you know what I mean? It just I will tell you the truth. I sat down and normally, you know, I, I sit down on my couch and I get my tall boy of beer and <laughs> I direct from a redneck place. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, get my, I get my tall boy of beer. I sit down on the couch and I crack open the play if I haven't read it before, yeah. right? And so Center Stage had asked me to direct this friend show. And I cracked open my beer and I cracked open the play. <laughs> um, and I read maybe two scenes and I said, nope, this one's stone cold sober because it's so intensely odd. Yeah. There's, there's no timeline. It jumps decades yeah. around at the same time, different characters at different times in their life sitting in the same room with mm -hmm. one another. Like mm. it's really, really intense yep. and meticulous. And so I actually had to get out uh, some graph paper and graph out some of the scenes to figure hmm. out how to get it all happening at the same time. It was, I, I do have to say, I, I was so, so pleasantly surprised, and I just loved the piece, and I loved um, the actors all in it. They're just, it was really, really, really cool. Yeah, mm. it was, it was a great I don't know anything about it. Um, it's, it's Andrew Bovell. Do you know Andrew, Andrew Bovell? I don't. I he, don't. Um, you know some of his work. Okay. Um, he, he worked in film with Boz Larman on Strictly Ballroom. Oh, yeah. He wrote Strictly Ballroom. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, he's a, an Australian playwright okay. and, and filmmaker, and uh, his work is just really, really um, experimental. Okay. And uh, so this this particular script is a family, and it deals with generational mm -hmm. inheriting the generational aspect of child molestation Ooh. and and things like that. And it takes place in England and in Australia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it takes place in you know, a flat and it takes place 20 years apart yeah. and it takes place on, um, Ayers rock in, yeah. in Australia, yeah. but it all takes place in one apartment. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Everything happens in one apartment. Yeah. And he said when he, when he wrote it, that in theater is the only place where people from different generations and different continents can inhabit the same space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. It was really, really neat. I need to study yeah. him. Yeah, you, I sh think you should look into I'm really reading intrigued. it. Yeah, yeah, reading it at first, kind of like, what the? Hell? It's hard. Yeah, honestly, it's a hard yeah, you do. And you go, I'm like, I don't see how this can even work. Mm. You know, because it almost would have to be in a cinematic format in order, you know, in the a way. The first thing that happens in the play is a fish falls out of the sky. Exactly. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, but then it, 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 it seems yep. funny, but it becomes really powerful. Yeah, yeah. Really it really powerful. was. Really, really was. And I'm not just blowing smoke, okay? Because, you know. <laughs> I, I, I love those. Yeah. That that to me, that is the most creative way of making theater. These kind of abstract and finding new ways. I mean, with Iranis Val, I mean, there was no set. Nothing. It, we yeah. just worked with the space and the characters. Yeah. And the text. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just. I love that. It was fantastic. Yeah, it was very similar in that respect too, because because of so many settings in in this uh, piece, you know, the, it was very minimal. Of course, that's how the fringe is done anyway. Mm. But so you're working with some of those elements mm -hmm. or lack of, and uh, you have to envision and really buy into the characters. And you know. and it was a fun process too, because I I worked with the ghost design team as well. And a lot of times mm. at the fringe, it's just set on the right. stage. You don't try to incorporate anything. Right. But I tried to incorporate some of the elements that they had. And so that, that was, was nice fluid. because it was really worked well for that, uh, I think. Yeah. I really do think it. And, of course, you had to struggle with the cast, too, because you had to change a cast member. We did a cast member just a and few so, weeks yeah. before we, we uh, mounted. Yeah. And Trev Furlong oh. stepped in. Mm. It was really beautiful. And took on that role. And I tell him every time I speak to him, you are my hero. <laughs> because he came in and was a force of nature in yeah. that role. He really was. Yeah. yeah. I have to agree. And just shamed everyone else's accents. <laughs> well, yeah. Because he was well. born with one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, other directing things, uh, gigs that I've really, really enjoyed were um, Cabaret at the Market. I mm. really enjoyed directing that show. That's the only show that I've ever directed where I actually watched every performance. Oh, wow. Mm. Um, we directed, because you loved it so? Because yeah. I loved the yeah. cast and what they were doing so much. Because we, we set it in the Cabaret Club, in the Kit Kat Club, and nothing took place outside of it mm -hmm. right and so the Kit Kat girls and boys never left 
They sat down beside audience members. Mm. Um, when people came in, when house opened, they were already there talking to people and serving them drinks and you know, just totally immersive um, experience. And I wanted to watch their improv. Mm. I wanted to watch what they did sure. every single yeah. night. It was brilliant. It was they a just play within work. a play. It was. Yeah, you yeah. got two things. You got you got a night of improv yeah. and candor in it. Yeah. 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 Nice. For, for a ticket price of, you know, 12 bucks. Yeah. There you go. Well, so and you can't great. beat that anywhere. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> but very good. So you recently returned from, let me make sure I get this right. It's the a- AACT, the American Association of Community Theater. They're... National Festival, yes, which the, happened up the in... Act the Act Fest. Oh, that's easy. We'll just call yeah, it There you go. <laughs> Why am I making it so hard? I don't know. You, you're like that, though, Melanie. You do. You like the... You know, you want all the words to be said. Well, you know, you well I think it is. And it's important. It I'm is not important, it's, it's important when you're first no, introducing. You that's don't want right. to just go straight for the acronym. You never assume that someone knows what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about at the time, so I need to clarify it for myself. <laughs> no. But you just returned. You... You were the director of Romeo and Juliet for Milltown Players. Yes. And that show, I am so sorry I didn't get a chance to see it. Me because, too. Oh, my gosh. my goodness, you went on the state level. You went to state competition with SCGA. it. Mm-hmm. And it won there. And then it passed on to SETC, the regional. Yes. And then it won there. And then it went to national. And so you took home some things from there. We did. We took home awards at every level. Um, we had at um, SCTA, the South Carolina Theater Association, we... Uh, of course got passed on but in that uh, round we I think it was like seven awards that we took wow. there mm. um, we got best director we got best actor and this is m- probably my proudest moment in the entire uh, process of Romeo and Juliet it was we got best actor in in uh, the South Carolina festival but it went to our M- Mercutio who was played by Kelly Crittenden and it's the first time in the history of SCTA that a woman has gotten the best actor not the best actress Wow. Oh, she played we the also got the best role, actress yeah. for Cindy Mixon. That's right. right? That's right. For, yeah. for That's the right. nurse. But but our, our female Mercutio was the first actress to get the actor award. And I, right. I just really love being cool. a part of that, right? I love that. Blurring the lines a bit there. Just a little That's bit. Good. Yeah, yeah. So that was a lot of fun. And, um, and there were other awards there, too. And then we went to Knoxville and did it there. And we had some actor and actress recognition there. And, of course, got passed on. And then at the national level, we were recognized for our actress for Juliet, um, Best Costumes. And, and an ensemble. Uh, an ensemble, ensemble yeah. a recognition for Amazing. ensemble as well. Yeah. yeah. And it's the first time in 34 years that South Carolina has represented the Southeast at the national level. So does that mean it's over? The show? Yeah. I mean, you know, we I, mean, had I don't party. know. Do they school? I mean, is it's there going more? To yeah, I mean, is there more and more? <laughs> you know, you, there is a national level. We didn't get passed on, I mean, an international level. We didn't get passed on for that, but, um, you know, the budget to take it to that would have been. been oh, cool. my gosh. Because yeah. getting it, to, yeah, yeah. Getting it to, to nationals, I mean, we really had a, a, a community wide effort of people putting yeah. in uh, for that, and we're very appreciative of that. Um, but <laughs> you asked, you know, as it go on, we had a, a cast party after the we got back, and I just kind of celebrated. Celebrating everything and saying goodbye to you know this thing that we've been working on for almost a year. Wow. Yeah. And um, the stage manager Kim Morgan, she <laughs> bought <laughs> these two the uh, chocolate chip cookie cakes, uh-huh. and one of them said Romeo and Juliet, and the second one said finally died. <laughs> <laughs> So that was fun. That's so that was fun. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, that is that's amazing. Yeah. What an amazing journey. An, mm-hmm. It was an honor. Like really, it was an honor. Wow. That's great. Oh, I hope somebody videoed that. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, I knew you, you guys had done a special performance. You know, again, a fundraiser type of thing before you left. All Those guys stuff. had a lot of performances because they had the run of the show. Mm-hmm. And they also did education outreach with it. Oh, so wow. they had several days mm. where they did two and three shows a day. Mm-hmm. And they brought in high school students, you wow. know, to, to see the performance. And it was a it was a concept that I think was very, very um, open to anyone in this area, at least, being able to come sure. in and mm-hmm. really grasp it in a way yeah. that they hadn't seen it before. I love the concept, yeah. you know, with it mm-hmm. being the Hatfield McCoy type S. Yeah, you yeah. Know. Appalachia. Yeah. That was Will Ragland. I, I believe... He started thinking about that concept when he was, I believe it was in grad school. It may have been undergrad. I'm not sure which one it was, but um, he did it for a project and Mm. he was kind of fleshing out that idea. And um, when he asked me to direct it, I was so excited because my father is from the mountains in North Carolina. Mm. Oh, wow. And so I was able to use so much of my paternal family history Mm -hmm. to layer onto those roles. My um, my great grandmother, um, his grandmother who raised him, 
her first husband, who is my biological great grandfather, his name was Bard, which is interesting because oh. I incorporated this funny. into a Shakespearean play. Yeah. But um, I remember growing up and seeing a picture of her with him um, and their two kids and not being able to figure out how that could possibly be her husband because she was around 16. Mm. When she married him, and he was close to eighty. No way. Yeah. And so he, it was a, oh my god, it was a trade off. Things are different in the mountains. <laughs> well, it was a, tra- it was a trade off for a debt, right? It was a trade off oh for a debt. Oh my god. And so we worked that in. That's how we did our Paris Juliet relationship. Is that the father was an oh alcoholic and he had a liquor debt, and Ooh. so when he, when he gave his daughter as a tender, uh-huh. it was a tender for the debt. Wow! So it was. Oh my got to play gosh. a lot of my dad's family history in there. It was did they wow. come see it? They didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> they did. You know, my parents are so bored with theater at this point. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's yeah. just like it's there's too many things to see. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and yeah, but that was their life. Or yeah. It was. They, they could have been it, like, wait a minute, it, that's it's familiar. Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But yeah, I, they didn't get to see it. So, um, but interesting. <laughs> Crazy. Well, the way to incorporate your life. And yeah. yeah. Tell the amazing. story, right? Yeah. Or exactly. Find those little nuggets and use well, them. You know, makes it so much more personal and meaningful. Right. I think, and even for the cast, because they're able to then say, oh, well, this this is an experience that they can draw on that really happened. Now, this happened. You know? Exactly. That's, and that's a big thing. Yeah, absolutely is. Mm. Okay, now Romeo and Juliet ha- has died, so we'll move on. <laughs> so we think. Yeah, well, right. they might be back. There might be a part two. Um, I don't know how, but. <laughs> a sister? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> An identical cousin, you know, it happens. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind seeing a sequel following what happens to the friar. Yeah. Like, what, what does he go through after yeah. all this? Yeah, because he has some serious guilt to get over, right? Mm. You got some spine on the door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to Heather's. Okay. We're currently directing current project. Yes. Heather's at Market Theater Company in Anderson. So this is like one of my favorites. This is Melanie's favorite. She wants to see all the Heathers. I everywhere. want to see all the Heathers that ever everywhere. happened. Mm-hmm. Well, because I, I am of the generation, as are you. We, we grew up on this show. This was this was a, a movie that came out when we were coming of age. Yes. And it, it was it was a big deal. It was a big deal. For Can us. I tell you a secret though? Oh yeah, go What's ahead. That? I am I am of the age. I had never seen the movie. Okay. She just looked at me with such scorn <laughs> she was, and yeah, disappointment. She, she kind of deflated a little. I feel like yeah. I need to go to confession. Or that yeah. was confession. She's yeah. going to give me... She's going to go away now. We'll finish the penance. interview. Chris, because, yeah, she can't imagine, you know, that that actually happened. No, I hadn't. I, I first I first came into contact with it as a musical. Wow. Really? Yeah. I was, so I was, even as an adult, you didn't ever backtrack and be like, No, well, I didn't know. I don't out. think I knew it existed. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I did. I did when I took the job to direct it. But I, before I heard the musical, I didn't know about that movie. And how do you not? I mean, Shannon Doherty and Christian Slater and, right. and Winona, uh, Ryder. Winona Ryder. You know, Amazing. it's it's eighties gold. It yeah. is. I mean, it's eighties gold. But it I guess is. I don't know. I was living on another planet or something. You missed that one. The first time I ran into it, I was helping build a set, and they were playing the music, you know, in the theater, <laughs> and I heard the line, "Lose those tidy whities." And I was like, what is this? <laughs> what are we listening Your to? Your ears perked Why up. is she belting that? <laughs> so that was my first, my first introduction to it. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Well, I was so excited when – I don't normally get excited when movies turn into musicals, although sometimes, but this was one. I was like, yes. Well, you know, they do it often. And now, oh, my yeah. gosh, yeah. All the time. It's hard to get time. terribly excited about it. Yeah. I know, because it's, it's usually what happens. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the standard canon now. So. It is. But this, I was so excited because because I, I loved this movie growing up. But you didn't because you didn't even know it existed. <laughs> tell me, so what made you want to direct it? Well, it's body and it's outrageous and it's funny and it's dark and it's crazy and it makes no sense. Uh-huh. Um, and yet it kind of does. It does. <laughs> I, I I talk to my cast about it regularly because it, it's irreverent, mm-hmm. but it's I feel very important to now because mm-hmm. it's it's kind of a benchmark on the movement of culture between it came out in 1988 i mm-hmm. think so between 1988 and 2019 what has happened in our society mm-hmm. because in 1988 everything that happened in that movie was ludicrous mm-hmm. 
and 2019, and now it's, you see everything it's, that happens in that, is in, the news. <laughs> in that movie is on the news. Mm-hmm. I was talking to a cast member uh, the other day, and we were talking about the fact that she's saying to Heather McNamara, um, <laughs> she's saying, why don't you kill yourself um, in the chorus, right? And mm-hmm. she's like, it's really hard for me to to do that. And I said, you know, but it's in the news because it was just in the past, what, six mm-hmm. months that the girl who helped right. talk her boyfriend Friend into committing into, suicide yeah. mm-hmm. was yeah. tried, you know, mm-hmm. and teen suicide and shoot them ups at school. And I mean, it's mm-hmm. all now. It's all now. Yeah. It's funny because I just saw Dear Evan Hansen and kind of similar mm-hmm. idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the concept, and I, I always go to the Peace Talks, and she mentioned this, uh, Dr. Broadway, who runs the Peace Talks mm-hmm. at the Peace Center before the shows, she mentioned this, that this theme that the creators of Dear Evan Hansen, about this concept of inserting yourself into a tragedy that you really had nothing to do with. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's kind of happening in uh-huh. the storyline of Dear Evan Hansen. And that was, and I remember thinking, well, Heather's. Yeah. Because here's this school that, mourning the deaths of these people it's like it's like you didn't even like them you didn't even know them yeah. and you yeah. certainly had nothing to do with this but yeah. yet let, and even let's veronica have... is called out on that when she confesses yeah to having killed heather chandler everyone laughs at her and says oh some people will do anything to try to be like the popular kids oh yeah, my gosh I know. right so it's uh, it's it it really is um, as as crazy as the the show is it really does point to what's happening in our time and also just high school mm. culture mm-hmm. uh-huh. you know because there are these elements and you heighten it with this comedy and this absurdity mm-hmm. but it still is high school and it's how right. people do things mm. when you are a hormonal teenager with a mind that is still developing and everything that an adult might think is not that dramatic to you is the biggest thing that you've ever experienced in your life so far. Right. And so it's, it's huge and it's, it's, yeah. it's great some show. of it's a little sad. It, <laughs> it is. It is. I find it more scary than yeah. sad in uh, certain points. Yeah. But, but what, what strikes me about these high school stories like Heather's and there's mean girls mm-hmm. and dear Evan Hansen's got a bit of this and you know, all these stories about these, dramatic high school and I, I hate to burst any young people who might be listening burst your bubble here but you know what life doesn't change that much no we we start in the on the playground in the sandbox and then it refines itself into something that we see in heathers and in, in high school and then it, it morphs again it refines itself it evolves again but you still got some of the same stuff going you know, on in if, adulthood if you go to a retirement <laughs> home <laughs> What yeah. you really have there is the same class from kindergarten mm-hmm. with wrinkles yeah. and more stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. That's I, right. It's really, you're yeah. still, it's so true. That person. I mean, I worked in assisted living, you know, companies and with, and it's amazing. You know, I don't like this person. I don't want to sit with them. I don't, you know, <laughs> sure. I'm, you know, they need to sit at that. And table. at that, you know, at that just, age, honestly, you're allowed yeah. to do it again. Oh, right. Because you when you're a kid, you can, you can say, say anything, anything you yeah. want. Mm-hmm. And when you're 90, you can say anything, anything you want. Yeah. 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 Exactly. But we find ways in between, and I think we're cutting our teeth on that when we're in high school so we can navigate the adult world. We find ways to adapt, to indulge those same behaviors, but with a little bit of flair, with a little bit of discretion, with it, whatever it takes to navigate or a label. that environment. Yes. A label to, to, to yeah. bully people by, whether it be politics or religion. Right. Or, you know, you label it with something that can be important to you, and then you can just treat people however you right. want to treat them. Right. And with social media. Oh, goodness. Help yeah. us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, think, I, I think that's a really key, that labeling thing. I was just listening to a podcast about this yesterday, about how the labeling leads to the dehumanization of certain groups sure. of people. So it's it's that. It's and you see that even in Heathers. They're dehumanizing the unpopular kids. Sure. The and, first number in Beautiful, they start the show off by calling each other names. Mm-hmm. By putting each other and the the book is written in such a way that the ensemble is given character names that are not names but the role that they play in high school. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Right. So you've got the young Republicanette. Mm. Um, the math geek. Mm-hmm. You have the preppy stud. Mm-hmm. Wow. You have the stoner chick. Mm. Right. So they're not. They're not people, named. They're labels. Yeah. They're labels. Yeah. Yeah. They're labels. And so it's very smart. It's yeah, yeah. Very smartly. Huh. Amazing. So tell, tell us a little bit about the show. What are some of your favorite parts? We've talked about 
wow. some of the themes, but I love Seventeen. Uh huh. I yeah. to me that is the heart of the message of the show. Whether you are seventeen or you are forty-one or however old you may be, the idea that can we be seventeen? Can mm-hmm. we take a moment and just be seventeen to go back to that innocence? And I love, I, I love the moment with JD and Veronica when they sing it. It's kind of the last bastion of hope before everything spirals out of control. <laughs> I mean, they've already killed someone. Oh gosh, <laughs> you know. But there seems to be a little hope that maybe they won't <laughs> blow up the school. Uh, <laughs> but but there's that, and then at the end when everything resolves, and there's this jubilant idea of, of can we be seventeen? Mm-hmm. And I love I love Kindergarten Boyfriend, mm-hmm. which is the swan song of Martha before she attempts suicide, and Sadie who is playing our our Martha, uh, she just she kills it. She just kills it. And it's I told her in one rehearsal, I was like, you realize that you are the the morality of this show. Like, you're the core morality of this show because you're the only innocent, you know, really in the yeah. show. And that we see where this behavior pushes you, mm-hmm. right? And then we see the resolution. The resolution at the end is Veronica and her kind of coming back together. That's what brings 17 back out. And mm-hmm. so I looked at her. I said, you know the weight of that responsibility. She's like, I feel it. I feel it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so wow. I, lo- I love Kindergarten Boyfriend. And tell us about your cast a little bit. Oh, a great cast, great cast. We have a lot of um, Anderson University, uh, South Carolina School of the Arts students who are putting out just some amazing talent. They do, mm. they do. Some amazing they really do. talent. Their, their theater program has just blossomed. Mm-hmm. We have um, students from there. We have two theater educators mm. um, in the cast, Jonathan Long and Aaron Gill. Aaron works at Woodmont. Okay. And Jonathan uh, works at Palmetto. Okay. And so two educators. And then, interesting, um, these two girls came into audition, the McMillan sisters, <laughs> right? And we have cast. Is that a cast name or is that the name? Like a musical That's act. the real name. It does. It sounds like it should, there, there should be three of them and, right. and three part harmony. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, the McMillan and sisters. army hats. Or something. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but they came into audition. They're from New Jersey. Um, they're both, uh, one of them is in college, one of them starting college this c- coming semester. And they just happen to be in Anderson for the summer. And so they're theater, you know, people. And so they said, they well, saw before we're both in different states at colleges, why don't we do one last show together Aww. as sisters? And they came in and they blew the roof off of the place. Like I, all of us at the casting table, we're just like, who are these people? <laughs> and come to find out, Cassie, the younger one, this year was actually the recipient of the Rising Star uh, Paper Mill Playhouse. Oh wow! Award. Oh wow! Yeah, she got that yeah. for her role of uh, Alice Murphy in Bright Star. Oh, um, amazing! So um, really promising talent um, and uh, great to work with. But yeah, it's a it's a great cast. Cool. Nice. Yeah. How big is the cast? Uh, we are seventeen. Okay. I'm going to say that because it's a song. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the only reason I'm pulling that number, but it's around 17, 18 people. Mm. Okay. And anything else that audiences need to know? What can they expect? Uh, you might not want, want to bring your kids, okay. uh, young yeah. children. It's a lot. Um, it's mm-hmm. stylized, but there's there's a good bit of violence uh, mm-hmm. in it and some, some language. Mm-hmm. Um, there. So is it a PG-13 or is it an R or is it a... I'd, what's say, P, I'd say PG-13. Yeah. I, in our society today, I'd say PG-13. Mm-hmm. And, unless you're, you know, on the more conservative side and then it might be an R for you. Okay. Yeah. Um, but... I think the movie was an R when it came out. Probably so. Of course, that was, was late, that was late yeah. 80s. Yeah. So yeah. standards have changed yeah, a little yeah, bit. It, but... Definitely. Definitely. I mean, there's nothing like terribly, terribly offensive, but it is edgy. It's very mm-hmm. edgy. So. Okay. It is. So know that and then... Uh, uh, Come see it because I think there's a lot you can take away from it. Mm-hmm. There's yeah. a lot you can take away from it. And you'll have a good time. Oh, I can't Super. wait. I can't wait. Awesome. So, Chris, anything else coming up that you'd like to tell us about? I, I cannot talk about any of the projects okay. that I'm in Fair talks enough. about right now. Ah, I'm in okay. talks with Gag four, four orders different, and all that kind of You know of how thing. it is in the yeah, theater yeah. world. Yeah, yeah. Until <laughs> things are announced, they're not a thing. Sure. Right. Um, so, yeah. I'm talking with uh, four different theaters right now about different projects and possibilities Great. of projects. So, We'll see. Which I know ones. you've been busy this last. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm going to get a little bit of a years, break right? after <laughs> after Heather's, and I am looking forward to yeah. it. You're going to be at home. We'll see. Oh, <laughs> we'll see. Okay. <laughs> I can take about two weeks at home uh-huh. with nothing to do, and then I start getting nervous, and mm-hmm. so I have to find you. something to get yeah. my hands into. Oh, well, very good. <laughs> well, this has been great, and it's always great to catch up. Like we said, it's we great always seeing like to, you guys. Yeah, yeah. nice yeah. to see you and catch up and find out what you're doing. So, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Yeah, we're damaged. Bad.
badly damaged But your love's too good to lose Hold me tighter Even closer I'll stay if I'm what you choose Can we be seventeen? If I am what you choose If we've still got the Cause right. you're the one I choose You're the one I choose You're the one I choose that was a fantastic conversation with Chris. It was. I haven't seen him in ages. I know. I didn't realize that, I guess. I mean, I've seen him. Of course, you've been flitting around the globe. So, you know, that's why. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you know, I, I, I don't get to see him very often. I run into him at productions and different things like that. And, and then I guess this last time I worked with him, it was when I did Delicatessen at um, Center Stage. So we kind of worked alongside each other then, which was great. Right. But I haven't had a chance to really sit down and catch up, so that's always fun. Well, I have a little information about Heathers, so let me just run through the ticket information. Heathers, the musical and market theater company in Anderson, runs Fridays through Sundays, July 19th through August 4th. Curtain time is 7.30 p.m., except for Sundays at 3 p.m. Tickets range between $10 and $12 and can be purchased online at www.themarketanderson.org. Heather's The Musical is recommended for ages 13 and up. The Market Theater Company is located at the Anderson Arts Center in downtown Anderson at 110 Federal Street, Suite 6. If you need to give them a call for extra help, 864-729-2999. There you go. It's a, it's a neat little venue. I don't know if you, you haven't been there, have you? I have not had a chance yeah. to go there, no. It's very rustic and... You know, lots of brick. It's kind of warehousey in that respect. Lots of brick mm -hmm. and wood and beams. And, and it's kind of a challenging space to, to work in and, and even to kind of sit in and to watch a show. But uh, I think this will probably be a good venue for this particular piece. So that's great. Yeah, I'm so looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, that's coming up next weekend, but there's a lot of stuff going on this weekend. We do have some. Let, let's get to it. Now playing in the upstate of South Carolina for the week of July 7, 2019, opening, Spartanburg Little Theater opens its summer extra production of the Rocky Horror Show on Friday, July 12th, and runs through Saturday, July 20th. Please note they only have one Sunday performance in their run, but they are adding a Thursday performance. They also have two midnight showings available during the run. Midnight shows will feature a costume contest, so dress up for those, and audience participation kits can be purchased at the event. And a content advisory, this is most appropriate for audiences ages 17 and up. The Warehouse Theater's Upstate Shakespeare Festival opens The Tempest in Greenville's Falls Park on Thursday, July 11th, and runs Thursdays through Sundays through August 4th. And this is a free admission with a 7 p.m. start time. Greenwood Little Theater's Greenwood Shakespeare Project presents Shakespeare Summer Scene Fest on Thursday, July 11th, and runs through July 13th. The Logos Theater in Taylor's opens The Boy Who Cried Wolf on Friday, July 12th. This runs only on Fridays through July 26th. Please note, curtain is at 2 p.m. for these performances. The Abbeville Opera House opens Ripcord on Friday, July 12th, and runs Fridays and Saturdays through July 27th, with one Sunday show on July 14th. And continuing this week, Logos Theater in Taylor's continues their production of The Horse and His Boy on Friday, July 5th, and runs Fridays and Saturdays through August 3rd. Greenville Shakespeare Company's Summer Shakespeare continues As You Like It on Monday, July 15th, and runs on Mondays through July 22nd. These are presented at Bob Jones University. Cafe and Then Some in Greenville continues Nightmare on Main Street on Wednesday, July 10th and runs Wednesdays through Saturdays through August 3rd. Alchemy Comedy Theater offers a variety of improv and sketch shows at various times and on various days at Coffee Underground in Greenville. Check the individual theater's websites for more details. 
We are definitely back in the swing of things. We really are. <laughs> Goodness gracious. So get out your calendars and figure it out. That's right. <laughs> Start penciling it in. That's right. And follow. Hello there, theater people. We hope you are enjoying spending time in the green room. Want to stay updated? Like and follow Thespis in the Green Room on social media. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Thespis G. That's at sign Thespis G. T H E S P I S G. Want to support Thespis in the Green Room? If you like what you're hearing and want to encourage us to continue conversations in the green room, you can become a patron of the show. Visit our Patreon page. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Thespis G. And donate today. No amount is too small and every little bit helps. Patrons will receive special content and audio extras through our Patreon page. Check it out at Patreon.com slash Thespis G. Good night and thank you, whoever. We are grateful you found her a spot on the sound radio. We'll think of you every time. Special thanks to Dick Stevens of Stevens Magic and Fun. He can be found on Facebook at Stevens Magic and Fun. Thespis would like to extend a big thank you to our fellow podcasters, Teddy and the Bassman, for their help and guidance. Listeners can find Teddy and the Bassman at teddyandthebassman.podbean.com or through podcast players, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Thespis in the Green Room is a Courageous Crossings production. Music used in this podcast is licensed by ASCAP and BMI. What comes next? You've been free. Well, I think that's about all from the Green Room today. I think so, too. As usual, it's nice to catch up with you. Here we're doing this remote thing for our bookings, but we had a chance to sit down with Chris, so that was really kind of nice. Yeah, you know? that was great to, to actually meet up in person with all three of us Around yeah, the table. That was, that was fantastic. Really great. Well, all right, Melanie, nice to chat with you as usual. Indeed. We'll let you go. All righty. We'll see you next time. All right. See you. Bye bye. <laughs>